reporters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the South, and I'm Camila Escalante. Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt has been sworn in for a new term following his party's sweeping win in Friday's general election. President Charles Savarin administered the oath of office. I, Roosevelt Skerritt, do swear. I, Roosevelt Skerritt, do swear. That I will fulfill, I will faithfully execute. I will, that I will faithfully execute the office of Prime Minister, the office of Prime Minister, without fear or favor, without fear or favor, affection or ill will, affection or ill will, and that in the execution of the functions of that office, and that in the execution of the functions of that office, I will honor, uphold, and preserve. I will honor, uphold, and preserve the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Dominica. The Constitution of the Commonwealth of Dominica. So help me God. So help me God. The spokesperson for the Commonwealth Election Observers Mission commended the government of Dominica for holding free and fair elections in accordance with the law. It is our considered view that the results reflect the collective will of the people who voted and that the 6th December election was conducted in accordance with the laws of Dominica. We commend and congratulate all Dominicans who participated peacefully in an important civic exercise. We also congratulate the election authorities and polling staff, the political parties, the police forces, and party agents for their respective roles in ensuring the success of the electoral process. But the island's opposition was not ready to accept Friday's results or their confirmation by the Organization of American States. During the OAS press conference, opposition members continued to question the validity of the electoral system. Prime Minister Skerritt declared his victory during a late evening address to the nation, but appealed to the Labour Party and supporters to hold off on celebrations and instead take the time to pray and reflect, postponing celebrations for one week. It is customary for various kinds of celebrations to follow elections. Nonetheless, given the volatility and tensions of the last few weeks, I am asking all Labour Party candidates to suspend their victory celebrations until next weekend. Instead, I am declaring Sunday, December 8th as a day of national peace, prayer, reconciliation, and healing. I am asking for all churches to hold services at 10 o'clock in the morning so that the entire country would be praying at the same time. Bolivia's movement towards socialism, a political instrument for the sovereignty of the People's Party, held a Congress of delegates from all departments of Bolivia with representation from indigenous and campesino social movements which make up the mass in the city of Cochabamba. The event included participation of leaders of the Cogalero region and other political leaders. They've discussed strategies to confront the coup and how to move forward with the process of change. Official candidates for the upcoming election were not named on Saturday. However, Evo Morales made a phone call in which he said to draw up shortlists to be taken for debate within the social movements. I think that today we are going to define the beginning of the line of struggle to maintain this process at the head of all the Bolivian people with that slogan that we are seeing a de facto coup and dictatorial government. I think it's important to ratify the strength of the Bolivian people. Evo Morales sent his love to the Congress saying he's appreciative of the confidence of the Congress having appointed him as campaign manager for the MAS. He said, quote, we will choose a unitary candidate and again we will win the elections in the first round. Thank you for not abandoning me. I will always be with you. Together we will continue to make history as we have won up until now. The incoming president of Argentina, Alberto Fernandez, has said that his administration cannot recognize Bolivia's de facto government, adding that for Argentina, Bolivia has no president until democratic elections are held. For us, Bolivia has no government until Bolivian citizens vote in democratic elections. 
It's as simple as that. A de facto government is not a government. So until Bolivians vote, they don't have a president we can recognize. Two more indigenous Brazilians from the Guajaras people have been killed in the village of El Betel by unknown gunmen. A car reportedly drove past and someone inside shot at the two men who were on a motorcycle. They were returning from a meeting on the defense of their rights. These latest killings are suspected to have been carried out by illegal loggers who have previously targeted forest keepers in the area. Residents have placed much of the blame for these attacks on far-right President Jair Bolsonaro and his anti-indigenous rhetoric. A group of indigenous activists from Brazil protested outside of the headquarters of an oil company in Spain responsible for a recent oil spill. The protesters performed chants and danced outside of Rep Sol's headquarters to highlight the issue. They also raised concerns about the rise in killings of indigenous people and pointed out that transnational companies investing in South America contribute to the violence. It is a very sad moment because every day in Brazil and in South America we see the killings of indigenous leaders. These are people that are fighting to defend their land, to defend their lives with dignity for the coming generations and for the children. And because of big companies, oil companies, dams, loggers, the agribusiness, mining companies, who have been investing strongly in South America. This has been contributing to what happened yesterday with the killing of two leaders from the Guajajara people and many others indigenous leaders. Every day these indigenous people are murdered in South America. Chile's government is currently going through its worst crisis as social upheaval has gripped the nation for over 50 days. As people continue to protest inequality and police brutality, international bodies have confirmed that recent human rights violations by the state justify a trial against President Piñera. Friday, December 6 marked 50 days since massive popular mobilization started in Chile. In this time, citizens have faced head-on the government's repressive actions. Piñera declared war on us a few weeks back. They have criminalized us. They have tried to keep us quiet, to make us invisible. But as a people, we continue our fight because we have a right to protest. Civil disobedience is a human right when facing such a repressive and violent government. After seven weeks of mass mobilizations, the government took political initiative to try and quell protests, despite the fact that President Sebastián Piñera holds a mere 4.6 approval rating among citizens. On top of this, he is facing a possible impeachment trial due to his involvement in the violence of citizens' human rights. We think it's an ethical duty that he be impeached. If you ask people on the street, everyone agrees with this. We know that we could lose in Congress, but ethically, the people will win because we will have upheld our own human rights. A recent report by the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights expressed concern for the unchecked use of force by security forces. So far, there's been 26 deaths, over 12,000 injured, and close to 30,000 arrested. On top of these numbers, 350 people have lost an eye as a result of police brutality. We have pointed out that there have been grave human rights violations. We cannot say these are mild abuses. Mobilizations continue as the debate over the creation of a constituent assembly is overshadowed by the government's security agenda. Things haven't changed since protests began because this government has chosen to criminalize us and ignore our demands about the social reforms we want to see. The people want a solution to this crisis. We've made that clear over the past 50 days. We have remained together. We are helping each other. We are seeing the things we have in common. This is a historic moment as everyone in Chile is coming together. I have been out here every Friday since the protests began because we cannot give up the streets. And this is what they do, week after week. Despite police repression, with their will and their hopes placed on changing Chile for the better. We'll take a short break now. Join us again in a minute. We 
are present at every event of where our nations are staring. We believe in a new global vision, united in every broadcasting. We keep expanding our horizons and working on a closer and better communication. Now, in Grenada, Telesur, the new source from South America and the Caribbean. The life is full of moments. Moments of fight. Moments of hope. Moments that present. Moments that you can live in. Telezul Documentaries. Sundays. Only on Telezul. Who's moving the chess man? What interests and motivate the actors behind each event? The board is deployed there. Critical move. Investigates every event from Monday to Friday. Only on the Sur. The Pakistani journalist Tariq Ali examines the mass media influence promoted by imperialism. Get access to the analysis of the socio-economic and political life of the whole South America on our screen and platform in English. A critical place committed to the truth to determine the major events that transform the world today. Mondays, only on Telesur. Welcome back. 200,000 Rwandan citizens are set to be vaccinated against the Ebola virus. The new vaccine hopes to protect people against the virus and to stop its spread from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Recently, the World Health Organization declared the Ebola epidemic in the DRC a public health emergency of international concern. Over 2,000 people have been killed by the disease so far, making it the second worst outbreak of Ebola to date. Today, we recognize the Rwandese decision and the Rwandese government's decision to deploy our Ebola vaccine in a new immunization program that is called Umurizi. And it's being coordinated by the Ministry of Health. And the new initiative will offer the vaccine to people who cross the borders with DRC on a regular basis, as part of work, as part of school, or other family commitments that they have. And the goal is to boost the protection against Ebola in these populations. A number of former Boko Haram members have completed a social reintegration program provided by Niger's government. More than 100 members of the jihadist group underwent vocational training in southeastern Niger. On completion of the session, they were allowed to leave the center and return to their normal lives. The training is the government's initiative to foster peace by helping militant members who volunteer to leave fighting and to be reintegrated back into society. I would now like to start by apologizing to my family and all those who were victims of Boko Haram atrocities, all those who were harmed, and apologize to everyone in Niger and Africa. The jailed brother of former Algerian President Abdelaziz Bouteflika appeared in court as a witness in a corruption trial involving millions of dollars. A number of businessmen and former government officials are currently facing charges of corruption following a popular uprising earlier this year against the political class. Said Bouteflika, along with several other high-level officials, were sentenced to 15 years in jail for conspiring against the state. 
The U.S. government has dropped its case against Gray Zone editor Max Blumenthal and member of the Embassy Protection Collective Benjamin Rubenstein. The case rested on an accusation by a Venezuelan opposition activist who claimed that Max and Ben assaulted her while they were delivering food to Venezuela's embassy in Washington, D.C. Here to tell us the rest is Max Blumenthal. Thanks for sharing the airwaves with us today. Thanks for having me on. So your charges got dropped. Sum up for us, if you can, how you went from the arrest on assault charges to a dropped case. Yeah, I mean, my charges were dropped, but not before I spent two days in jail in very agonizing circumstances and was close to having to pay thousands and thousands of dollars out of my own pocket to muster up a legal defense. And this is part of a pattern of the right-wing Venezuelan opposition in Washington, whose leadership is directly being paid by the U.S. government, uh, targeting their political opponents using law enforcement as a weapon. We saw this happen recently to Code Pink founder Medea Benjamin, who was almost hauled out of her house on the basis of false charges by Carlos Vecchio, the fake ambassador of Juan Guaido's uh, minions, falsely accusing her of assault. So the government obviously judged that it had no case against me. Um, I guess they didn't want to go to trial. But one of the most interesting things we've learned is that on the night of the alleged incident uh, where this false accusation is derived from, the Secret Service call logs have disappeared. Pretty much all recordings that the Secret Service made at that time have mysteriously disappeared. So uh, raises a lot of questions about the disappearance of evidence and the collusion between the Secret Service police who are outside the embassy and this violent right-wing Venezuelan mob of hooli opposition hooligans. So what I've observed is that within Nicaragua, Bolivia, and Venezuela, if you commit yourself to counter-hegemonic English language reporting, and now with a growing reach within the United States left, it doesn't take long before you get noticed by the right wing. So to what extent do you think the Venezuelan right identified yourself as a problem and actually conspired against you and others there? Oh, it's, it's absolutely the case, uh, because uh, Benjamin Rubenstein and I were among 20 people nonviolently delivering food and sanitary supplies to the Venezuelan embassy. I was also documenting it as a journalist on the night of May 8th. And just because I happened to be identified, they chose to target me because I'm one of the most prominent journalists poking holes in the opposition's narrative, along with my colleagues at the Gray Zone. And actually, our colleague, Wyatt Reed, was recently at an event uh, where Carlos Vecchio and members of Congress did a press conference. His phone was stolen while he was recording by a member of the Venezuelan opposition working for Carlos Vecchio. And then he was taunted when he demanded his phone back, you're going to wind up like Max Blumenthal and Benjamin Rubenstein. So it's obvious they were targeting us. This is about intimidating people who oppose these US-backed right-wing opposition movements. And we should consider the record in their own countries of these opposition movements. For example, the right-wing Nicaraguan opposition burning down the offices of Radio Ya last year because they didn't like what they were broadcasting. Okay, so I don't know how much you watch Spanish language news, but Fernando del Rincón and Jorge Ramos over at CNN Español and Univision love to talk about freedom of expression and press freedom. Do you think they or the followers of these right-wing activists of the bourgeois media care about your right to carry out your work? Well, I'm sure they were happy when I was arrested and I'm right in the middle of a long Twitter thread exposing everyone, uh, blue checkmark pundits, prominent re pro-regime change pundits in the US and the West who celebrated my arrest, who insisted that I was guilty before being proven innocent and took the side of the cops. But uh, as for Jorge Ramos and the kind of journalistic press freedom organizations that honor him or the Committee to Protect Journalists, which recently honored uh, Miguel Mora, the uh, head of Cien Percento Noticias in Nicaragua, who told me on the record that he wanted a military intervention in Nicaragua to remove Daniel Ortega. Um, the, these people have been obviously silent but Jorge Ramos, when I encountered him at the Miami airport after he had just done his famous uh, ambush interview with Maduro, told me that Mike Pence and Marco Rubio 
told him that they were happy with what he did in Venezuela and he was proud to have their support. So it's obvious what all of these press freedom groups and all of these prominent Latin American journalists who are celebrated in the US are about. And it's about advancing the prerogatives of Washington and serving as stenographers for the State Department. Okay, so a lot of online trolls of people like you or I often have this line about how this or that authoritarian is paying us to defend their government practices. In terms of funding, I don't think the gray zone or Telesur English is anywhere on the map in terms of funding and resources compared with Univision and other mainstream outlets which dare to cover Latin America. Marco Rubio's uh, media friends make exponentially more than I think we'll ever see carrying out their role in the information war, and yet they don't come under the same scrutiny. Do you think the American people still not know how the corporate media works? Well, they, they, they don't, and they don't see it, unfortunately, as a kind of, um, it, it's, it's actually more insidious than what you see in societies that genuinely are authoritarian, where people know they're being propagandized by the state. They don't realize that when US officials are constantly being quoted or um, U.S. funded supposed journalist organizations like Bellingcat are being quoted in the New York Times. They're actually getting state propaganda. But let me make uh, one thing clear. The gray zone is not state funded. When we go down to Venezuela or Nicaragua to give voice to the people that are under the imperial gun, we are not taking state funding or resources in any way. Uh, and I'm here in complete solidarity with Telesor, which is under attack. Uh, Many people there are basically having to wait months and months and months for paychecks because of U.S. sanctions. Um, these are, this is the kind of journalism we should celebrate. Telesur was created to finally have a socialist-oriented network in an environment that's completely dominated by right-wing private media serving the agenda of multinational corporations and the United States. So we need to stand up for Telesur and for independent media and we're all in this together. We're all under the same attack. Awesome. And so let's talk about sending people down here to cover things on the ground in Latin America. You have a correspondent or you have someone working with you in the gray zone at the gray zone in Bolivia right now. Why did you prioritize that? And what are some of the things you're trying to cover there? Well, you know, the, the, the Guardian and the New York Times editorialized in support of the coup in Bolivia and even denied it was a coup. Uh, we saw Ken Roth, the president for life of Human Rights Watch, uh, declare that Morales had cooed himself and supported it. This is supposed to be a human rights organization. So you have basically radio silence on the wave of right-wing terror being carried out by Janine Añez's minions and a right-wing military junta. And so Wyatt Reed is down there on a shoestring in Bolivia, and I know you were there as well, Camila, and there are a few other um, really solid independent reporters to show the other side. Um, and I think Wyatt has done some important reporting on what the few left-wing journalists who are still trying to report against the tidal wave of pro-government propaganda, how they are being disappeared, jailed, and hunted. Um, and we're, again, we're hearing nothing from the major press freedom organizations about the brave reporters at La, Res La Resistencia, for example. Yeah, great example with, uh, with that and other grassroots media there. One last question. You've been cleared of those Trump charges. Do you plan to take any legal action now against those who tried to persecute you? It's frightening that uh, someone from a uh, opposition movement that's backed by the United States government can level a false allegation and have police show up at the door of that person uh, simply because that person is a political opponent, someone they, whose politics they don't like. They can have that person jailed and prosecuted without any investigation by the police. So there needs to be some kind of recourse here. And I'm exploring what can be done to make sure that people can't accuse me or other uh, journalists like me or other activists uh, of you know things they didn't do and basically see them politically persecuted. There has to be some kind of recourse, so I'm exploring my options. Thank you so much, Max. We've been speaking to journalist and editor of The Gray Zone, Max Blumenthal. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this.
Welcome back. In Bolivia, a National Congress of the Movement Towards Socialism Party held on Saturday named Evo Morales as the director of the MAS's electoral campaign. The Congress resolved to maintain unity among the social movement bases and leaders in order to organize the upcoming elections. The MAS is demanding that the Legislative Assembly establish a trial against Janine Añez in which ministers the police and military will be probed for genocide and for crimes against humanity. The mass Congress resolved to establish a commission for human rights to follow up on the cases of persecuted and imprisoned members, and they're demanding the immediate approval of the law of guarantees by the legislature. At least 17 people were killed overnight in Iraq's capital, Baghdad, as protests continue. The attack also left dozens wounded. Armed men in pickup trucks reportedly opened fire on a building where protesters had been camped out for weeks near the capital's al Sinek Bridge. Anti-government protests have been ongoing for two months in Iraq, leaving nearly 500 dead. The armed groups were in al Khalani Square, and the governmental forces were armed and one kilometer away along with their divisions. However, they did not interfere. Australia continues to be affected by massive bushfires as the country braces for a heat wave expected early this week. The fighters, firefighters are working around the clock to try to put out some of the 140 blazes, some of which have already reached the capital, Sydney. Six people have been killed and more than 700 homes destroyed since the crisis began in September. We've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at tellusourenglish.net. And we're on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Our English, I'm Camila Escalante. Thanks for watching. The Pakistani journalist Tariq Ali examines the mass media influence promoted by imperialism. Get access to the analysis of the socio-economic and political life of the whole South